ju just before Pope John Paul died, um, he insisted, or he was very the adamant. Pope, the Pope, the, pope, yeah, the pope, last Pope. John Paul II. Yeah. Um, just before he died, he was very adamant or insistent, um, although he wouldn't have the power to choose, uh, that Ratzinger became the next Pope. And was against or for? Was for. Very yeah. adamant that Ratzinger would say, become the next Pope. Um, so, uh, is there some sort of um, I'm almost kind of symbolic gesture in, 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 in the idea that, that a Polish man uh, is encouraging uh, um, the last living ties to the to, to a, a Nazi era? Um, because Ratzinger was a member of the Nazi youth, um, although we can imagine his report card, you know, refuses to participate in genocide. Um, so, you know, so um, no, it's just a, it's a, on a symbolic level. Sorry, um, it, like, and, and I'm not saying that Germany needs on the world stage this absolution, but if it ever was to be held against them, I mean, was the making of Ratzinger the new pope a kind of symbolic gesture um, that uh, Germany itself? doesn't have to always be held responsible for the actions in the Second World War. From, from the fact that I work and make investigation on theology, liturgy, the history of the church, you must not uh, get the impression that I am an expert on Vatican of business. <laughs> not at all. So I know nothing about this. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I know, which is kind of oh. peculiar which is that before Ratzinger was the Pope, he actually was writing the encyclicals on the family. And um, he was working for, for the Pope. Yes, for the Pope. And he came out very strongly against um, uh, gay marriages. He came out very strongly against certain forms of feminism. He came out very strongly as well um, against the idea that gender might be multiplied beyond two. He actually made a public statement um, that there were some people who were saying that there are five genders and that he was opposed. He's also the one who formulated the idea that gender is a code word for homosexuality and opposed the UN efforts to um, uh, convene uh, um, uh, um, the, the Council on the Status of Women on the topic of gender. So I actually think, I mean, there are many is issues with Ratzinger, but I think that um, the Vatican decided to take on some of these social issues, not that that's the only reason. Um, I think we've also seen since Ratzinger has become Pope uh, a, a series of other issues where um, where Holocaust deniers uh, in South America were nevertheless um, given um, forgiveness or allowed back into the fold after they had been excommunicated from the fold. And, that, and, and so we actually, I think, are seeing this whole issue about, um, um, uh, not about Germany. I don't think it's about German, Germany. I think it is about how to tell history or what kind of history is tellable and and a relationship to revisionism that is that is not fixed that's not clear um, it may also have to do with the vatican's own implication in that period of time um, i think we probably have to have a kind of broader framework to understand the multiple fronts on which the vatican is acting both in the former administration and the present one. Um, in the natural world, things aren't punished, they perish. And I, I find that sort of interesting that we, is, it's maybe, maybe in this like more question, like is it a fear of death, of the perishing that makes us insist upon the punishment, and then how that would relate to a sense of vengeance. You know, what, or, uh, I don't see really, there is not any analogy, only metaphoric for the fact that you're saying that uh, in nature things perish and, uh, and uh, the juridical trial, which has an accusation and the judgment, there is nothing in nature of this kind. The fact that uh, uh, there is a process and uh, things perish, uh, there is no fault, 
no accusation, no judge, no judgment, and no punishment. Mm. You don't see any... This is just a, a metaphor. And, and I still believe, and to go back to the problem of uh, accusation, uh, uh, perhaps accusation is really the, the, the foundation of law. Because uh, the word accusation comes from the Latin causa. And causa, of course, in the beginning was the thinking debate, the, the, the thing about people are fighting. You know, the, the, so the juridical uh, li, 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 how do you say? conflict, you know, mm -hmm. the juridical conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this, uh, so the accusation is the beginning of this, the moment where someone is captured in the legal system. And you should never forget also that the devil is the accuser. Mm. Diabolos mm. means the accuser. Mm. And uh, there is a, a nice history in uh, Jewish tradition. It's that after the judgment has done, uh, the last judgment has done, God calls the devil and he tells to him, uh, now I judge yourself because you are the accuser. You accuse the man of this. You accuse uh, uh, the list all the accusations uh, uh, the devil has done. Uh, that also, it's fun that the devil answered, but this I made for you. <laughs> but I mean, the, uh, I mean, the, the, I'm still convinced that the accusation is something very important, very strong, very, uh, and we, it's more important than the fault because fault comes after the accusation, not before. Mm -hmm. Once you have, you, have you have been accused, fault begins. Mm -hmm. So we should uh, yeah. think about it. You know, it's interesting, as I've been reading Arendt recently, it occurs to me that she doesn't actually ever think about the violence of judgment itself, or even the violence of accusation itself. Um, it's a kind of profoundly, it's against, it's against Nietzsche, for instance. <laughs> um, um, uh, she wants to make sure there can be judgment, you know, and and of course this raises the question of the relationship between accusation and judgment. The, the act of sentencing is um, is is both accusation and um, and final judgment. Um, yeah, there is no judgment without an accusation. There is no judgment without an accusation. Um, of course, um, you know the other end of this, and maybe this goes back to the question about natural process, you know, in Nietzsche's On the Genealogy of Morals, when he talks about the development of the institution of punishment, he describes a situation where um, we inflict pain or we suffer, but we, we don't yet ask uh, who is responsible for uh, our suffering, or we do not yet assume responsibility for the suffering of others. So, um, it's only through uh, transforming um, suffering into injury that um, the accusation becomes possible and we hold subjects accountable for, um, for the injuries that they do. Um, but the real question for me, and I think it's actually one that Benjamin also raises um, uh, in various places, is not whether mm, we can I mean, I'm sure that I, I feel very strongly that we do need modes of accountability, right? Uh, I, I, don't, I, I doubt very much that the Eichmann trial was the best way to hold Eichmann accountable. So I'm not against modes of accountability at all. And yet, I wonder whether by taking the juridical framework as the, as the exclusive or even the dominant way of understanding suffering, whether we, 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 we start to imagine that all suffering can actually be redressed, <laughs> um, that we can find accountable agents uh, for what we undergo, right? There are forms of, of illness, there are forms of anguish, there are forms of heartbreak for which there are no responsible subjects. <laughs> and yet uh, the notion of the subject emerges precisely in order to um, to um, collapse or reduce suffering into accountability. 